My name is Simon Brown. I'm wearing a suit. I, I am super stoked to be here this evening. I'm super stoked to have a live audience. We've got a thousand people on the webcast, but I appreciate the folks who have made the time to come through to Rosebank uh, and be with us this evening. Uh, key point, everything this evening, all the images are from Dolly 3. I love AI. So Dolly 2 was great. Dolly 3 came out a few weeks ago. It's absolutely excellent. Sometimes Dolly 3 goes wacky. We'll have a look at some of those as well. We can't help but, but notice that. Getting started in shares. So the first question is, what's a share? And a share is quite simply, and sometimes we call it an equity, sometimes we call it a stock, because this is an industry that loves jargon, and the more jargon it seems to make us happier. So the first port of call is that a share is literally owning a slice of a business. We're at the Standard Bank building here in Rosebank, and you could have a share of Standard Bank. Standard Bank's about a 200 billion rand business. I don't think any of us have got 200 billion lying around, but we can buy a share for 200 bucks. And now you own some Standard Bank. Across the road is Rosebank Mall, owned by Hyprop. We could buy a share in Hyprop. Within Rosebank Mall is, well, shops galore, right? All the retailers, clothing and food, all the banks, etc. And those are shares, and we can invest into them. And that's what shares are, and that's what investing is about. It's about buying businesses that we hope are going to make us profit. And we'll come to that hope and how we do it in, in a moment. But it's hugely important that we understand that we really are buying a slice of a business, a slice of a giant business. So, as I said, stocks, shares, equities, you own a small slice of that business. And what does that get you? Well, firstly, it gets you a share of the profits. And this is important. Standard Bank, 50,000 staff, they exist to make profit, fair enough. And as they make that profit, every six months they publish results telling us how great they have or haven't done. And they take some of that profit and they give it back to you and I, the shareholders. It's called a dividend. In time, that dividend grows. An example, if we go, and I'm going all the way back in time, if we go all the way back to 1994, and I go there because that's where my data starts, Standard Bank shares were two or three rand a shot, and today you're probably getting a five rand dividend. The key point there, 30 years. Key point around investing, it's about time. It takes time. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. Want to get rich in a hurry? Marry money. <laughs> Lotto don't work, nothing else don't work. So what we're doing is we literally we're buying, and it's willing to buy a willing seller. And what matters? I've got shares, ShopRite. I'm going to talk about ShopRite a lot tonight. I bought my first ShopRites in 2004. I still hold them. I still get a dividend every six months from ShopRite. I will continue to hold those until either I sell it, ShopRite goes bankrupt. I can't see that happening, but never say never. Or I pass away. In which case, that share forms part of my estate and then goes to my heirs. Or they change name. We, the name changes happen. They love the name changes. In fact, ShopRite was probably checkers way back in the, in, in the day. But we buy those shares, we hold those shares, and they're ours. And as I say, they're mostly businesses that we know, businesses that we interact with. There are exceptions. Fungela. And a lot of you are like, who's Fungela? So their head office is about 100 yards that way. They mine coal, both in South Africa and Australia. So it is the brands we know. It's also the brands we don't know. It's companies we don't, you know, BHP Group and the like. Sassel. We don't interact with Sassel. Or maybe we buy some petrol from them. But you get the sense around that. And that's the important thing. This is only, South Africa has tens of thousands of companies, probably hundreds of thousands. Some of them minutely small. My own, just one lab. Tiny little company. About 300 are on the JSE. About 100,000 are listed globally, and we can get access to those. We'll touch more on that in a moment. What are we looking for when we are buying a share? Because it's one thing to say, you know what, I love that 6060 scooter, I should have some shop rights. Yeah, yes, no, maybe. What matters is quality. I always stress, buy the quality. When you've got two companies that are similar, and you're looking at them, and you're saying, which one should I buy? Buy the winner. Don't buy the loser in the hope they become the winner. Why? Because the winners know how to win. The winners use their winning to their advantage. They're almost like the schoolyard bully in a sense. They're eating the lunch of, of everybody else. So we want those winners. We want the ones who know how to win. For the, for the second place to get in front and be the winner, they've either got to run faster or hope the winner stumbles. Both are possible. But why not just hop on the winning bus? And if one day they stop winning, I used to own pick and pay. 
Then one day they stopped winning. I don't own pick and pay no more. You don't like it anymore, you simply sell it. Growing profits and dividends. Remember, those dividends are your share of the profit. Now, importantly, there will be tough periods. The pandemic had all sorts of chaos. Now, sometimes in the short term, a business has a, a, runs into a stumbling block. Is it of their creation? In other words, have they as a business messed up? Or is this a more broad scenario where it's a pandemic and it doesn't matter how good your business is, you've been kneecapped as a result of it? So we've got to understand those distinctions. They need a moat. A moat is like it would be in the, in the classic European days of castles and moats and crazy things like that. But businesses have weird, for example, Standard Bank has a moat. What is that moat? Well, firstly, have you tried changing a bank account? It's not fun. But more than that, it's just the, the, the setting up a bank. It costs, it's going to cost Old Mutual a couple of billion rand to set up a bank. It costs Discovery a couple of billion rand to set up a bank. You can do it, but man, you need deep, deep pockets. ShopRite's moat is slightly different. Their moat is, is that we as consumers really feel that ShopRite cares for us and is trying to give us a good deal. And that's a weird sort of moat in a sense, right? It, it's sort of esoteric. But if you're old enough, you'll remember the days of Raymond Ackerman as the consumer champion, fighting bread fixing prices and petrol prices and all of those sort of things. And what happened was that was their moat for a while and it decayed away and ShopRite has taken it over. ShopRite sells in their, in their ShopRite stores, they sell five rand lunches. It's a loss leader. The person who's buying that lunch knows it's a loss leader. And that gives them love for want of a, a better word. In, in, the, in the shop rights at Emerentia and just across the road here, sorry, the checkers, they sell a lunch and a coffee for 35 rand. And you look at that and you're like, man, I couldn't even make that at home for 35 rand. Yeah, like a chicken wrap, a coffee. And you realize that actually they're looking after you. And their motors, they can do that and still make profit. Their operating margin, and don't worry about the, the, the jargon there, their operating margin about 6%. Pick and pays when they were profitable, one and a half percent. Spa, one and a half, two percent. In other words, they make three times more profit on every hundred rand that goes through the till than anybody else. That is a moat, and that moat prints profit and makes dividends for us ultimately. A lot of investing is common sense. A lot of it is, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, hmm, something doesn't seem right. Then walk away. You can always come back. You can always take another opportunity. But what's important is that use that common sense. And I appreciate common sense isn't always so common. But use that common sense to make sure that we're doing the right thing, that we're making informed decisions, that we are avoiding gambling and hope and a prayer in our investing. I got an email this week. Uh, in fact, I've had a couple. Um, you know, to the to the subject line, to the, to the version of, uh, uh, are you a gambler? Would you be buying transaction capital? I'm like, uh, no and no. Is transaction capital going to go up? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I can give you reasons why it would, reasons why it won't. But I certainly don't see a quality business growing profits and dividends and with a moat. With respect, they own SA Taxi. So could you buy it and it doubles? Yes. But could you buy it and it goes bust? Yeah. And you know what I dislike intensely? Losing money. What I dislike even more is losing money because I did stupid things. Like buying Stein. <laughs> there is risk in investing, and I'm going to talk a lot about risk. I've got a lot of slides on risk. The key way we manage risk is we diversify. In other words, we don't just buy Standard Bank. We also go and buy ourselves some shop rights. We also go and buy some Mr. Price. We also go and buy some Kelgro M3, et cetera, et cetera. We go and buy multitudes. So we can manage that risk. So that if you've got a Steinhoff, an Ellie's, an African bank, a Tongart, who goes bust, Sorry, some of you winced. <laughs> if you've got one of those shares that goes bust, that happens from time to time. You've got others as well. But then let's get on to some real numbers. This is a top 40 index. And you're saying, what's an index? Index is a basket of shares. So what this is, is the 40 largest shares on the JSC, which is our local stock exchange. And it does an average move. So today I will tell you that the top 40 was up 0.8%. Some stocks were up 2, 3, 4, 5, 6%. Some were down 2, 3, 4%. The average is 0 0.8. It's a basket of the 40 largest shares. And those 40 shares change. 
It was once African Bank. It was once Steinhoff. They've got both gone bust. They've both exited the index. Two important points. First is the return. And I've gone back to December 20, 2000 because that's when the first ETF came out. And I'll talk more about ETFs in a moment. We've done 10% CAGR. CAGR is a fancy word. Compound annual growth rate. In other words, we've done 10% per year of growth. We add dividends into that of about 3%. That's your share of the profits. It's done about 13% over the last 23 and a half years. Not every year. As you can see, some years it did a heck lot less. Some years it was quite negative. Some years it was better. The average has been around 13%. That effectively gives you, what, what shall we say inflation was over the period? 5%, 6%, let's say 6 top of the band. That gives you 7% real return after inflation means you're doubling your money about every decade. Again, you're not getting rich in a hurry. If you put a thousand rand into that ETF back in December 2000, that thousand rand is now worth four in today's money. You've made real profit. And I don't know what you're thinking. You can't retire on 4,000. Of course you can't. But you also only put 1,000 rand once into an investment. Imagine if you did that every single month over 23 and a half years. And I've just backed myself into a corner with the math. It's about 250 months in total. It's about 200. Uh, don't. St I'm doing this in my head. I'm going to come out at about 720,000. Again, you're not retiring on 720,000. Maybe you are actually. It depends. But I hope not. <laughs> but again, it was a thousand bucks a month. The key secret, Tom. It's why I love speaking to school kids. Because what have they got in abundance time? Decades of it. Of course, they're kids. They don't appreciate it. But nonetheless, this changes. The stock's in there. As I say, every quarter, the JC administers it and says, oh, no, you're a bad stock. You go out. So these are ETFs, indices. I'm going to come back to them. Let's get to how do we buy a share. So there are broadly three ways. A stockbroker, a collective investment scheme. Um, or a, a financial services provider. Stockbroker is such a standard online share trading. Registered with the JSC, that gives you protection. The JSC has got, a, 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 I forget what they call it, a giant pile of a couple of billion. So if there's any fraud or, or malfeasance, they can see you right. If your broker goes bust, the shares are held separately. They don't disappear with your stockbroker. Gives you all that sort of protection. Financial service providers are your financial institutions, your insurers, your banks in some cases, and in some cases, stockbrokers. Also, sorry? Pension. Pension funds, all of those. And in some cases, they will also be stockbrokers. They're registered with the FSCA, Financial Sector Conduct Authority. It's kind of like the overseeing body. They will have, again, insurance policies in case there's any more seasons. The shares are held in separate ring fenced entities. Can fraud happen? Sure. Does it happen often? No. Do clients lose money as a result? Even less, no. And there have been cases. There's that uh, uh, one that came out, I think, was it early this year or late this year, last year? Some chap who took a couple of billion. It's like the never had paperwork. He wasn't registered anywhere. Basically, he was running it. It looked like he was running it out of his bank account. There's some financial institution, and I put that in inverted commas, says, here's my personal bank account, send money, block them on everything. Just like, thanks, but no, I don't send money to randoids like that. Collective investment schemes, unit trusts, many of us will know those. Exchange-traded products and hedge funds. I'm going to park hedge funds on the side. I'm going to ignore those for now. But let's focus on unit trusts. We know what those are. Those are... As the, the, the name says, collective investment schemes, we pool all of our money together, we give it to an expert manager who buys and sells shares to try and make us a profit in the market. That is called active investing. In other words, they will purposely say, well, look at all of these shares that are on the top 40, those 40 companies that are in there. We don't like that one, so we're not going to have it. We do like that one, so we'll have more of it. They're trying to beat the market. They're trying to beat the index. The math is simple. Beaver, Standard & Poor Indexation versus Active, a mouthful. They do research. It's a global company. They do research every year around the world. How many of these active managers beat the market? The answer is 15%, 1,5%. In other words, when you're picking an active manager, that's one year, and as it gets worse as it goes on. When you're picking that active manager, you've got a one in six chance of picking the winner. Question, do you feel lucky? Because truthfully, that's almost what it comes down to. 
Exchange traded funds are passive. They say, you know what? We don't know what the best share is. So we're just going to buy all 40. We're going to put them in a basket. We're going to call it an ETF. And we're going to sell you that ETF. So you buy one ETF and you've got 40 shares. What have you got there? Make no mistake, you got some shares you wish you didn't have. Of that 40, there are a couple you're like, really? But you know what? You've got the others as well. You've got instant diversification because you've got 40 businesses. So when Steinhoff went bust, it lost 70% in one day. Yet the index lost one and a half. And you can't even... So it happened around there somewhere. I couldn't even tell you which particular day it was. So you get that basket. And what that basket does is it gives you the diversification and it's nice and easy. That's why I went back to December 2000 because that's when the first ETF in South Africa was listed. Patrick's 40. I bought it. I think I paid around six or seven rand for it. And this is yesterday's close. It's now trading at 66 rand 90 cents. And I've received dividends over the 20 plus years that I've held it. So it's instant diversification. It's easy. It requires a little bit of thinking, but not too much. So let's quickly dig a little more into this. Exchange traded products, you would buy them from a stockbroker or an FSP on the exchange as you would normally do. They are low cost. That unit trust has got active managers who are buying and selling the shares. They want salaries. They want bonuses. They want fancy cars and offices and marketing campaigns, and this all costs money. The ETF basically needs two folks. One runs the spreadsheet, and the other one makes sure the laptop's plugged in. Okay, with apologies to the ETF issuers, but kind of like that. So whereas a unit trust could be charging you 1, 2, 3%, the ETF is charging you 0.1. I think the most expensive ETF in our market is 0.86%. And I think that's a horror number. Most of them are around 0.2, 0.3, maybe 0.4%. That's your total investment cost. If you're buying an investment product, ask them what the total investment cost is. That's what matters. If they come to you and say, our fee is, fee is not a legal term. Total investment cost is a legal term. Ask what the TRC is. And if their eyes get lazy and they haven't really got an answer, move swiftly along. They passive, they track a methodology. Now, I've mentioned already that methodology in terms of the top 40, the 40 biggest shares on the JSC in South Africa. But you've also got others. You've got local. So, for example, in America, we've got something called the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the same idea, except it's the 500 biggest companies listed in New York. And of course, it is multitudes bigger than what we have here in South Africa. Just uh, the US, you know, our economy is a half a percent of the global economy. The US is around 25 percent. I just want to do a quick check, make sure everything is scrolling there. Everything is working. Excellent. So you can buy niche ones you could say you know what i don't want to general i want to buy one that covers finance or tech or mining resources you can go buy commodities gold is currently having its day in the sun you could go and buy a gold one as well you can buy india india is doing great japan has suddenly been doing well so you can go and get niche you can get currencies you can get emerging markets you can get private credit you can get offshore or local small caps these are all available nice simple and easy and that's important it's the simpleness and the easiness of it, and it's that immediate diversification at the same time. I said I was using Dali. So all these pictures are Dali. So what are those little things? Cats, dogs, elephants. Have we invented a new species? I did not. I asked for a table of people who were buying and selling shares, and we got those weird things. I noticed there's some food. They've got some drivos. They've got oysters. And Dali still struggles with hands. Not as bad as previously, but look at some of those hands on the left. Dali's a little, it's, it's getting there. It's getting, hey, it's only Gen 3. It's still early days. We can't take too much away from it. Why is my clicker not working again? So what about other investments? We've been talking about shares here for now. But there are other investments out there in the universe at the same time. Lots of other ones. For example, uh, 
cash, money market, income funds, bonds. Many of you will know these, many of you might invest. If you've got money in a savings account at the bank, well, that's effectively cash. Bonds are debt instruments. So you've basically lent money to a government or a corporate or a state-owned enterprise, and they will pay you a, a, a regular uh, interest payment, quarterly, biannual, annually, whatever the case may be, and at the end of the period, they'll give you your money back, all things being equal. You can get at the moment some really good returns there. The RSA retail savings bond offering 11 and a quarter percent guaranteed for five years. Your risk, the government paying you back. And truthfully, our government's gonna pay it back, right? Because if nothing else, they own the printing press. I know inflation and devaluation and all of that. The point is they can pay it back. And also we are small change compared to the rest. The key thing, and let's quickly go down that rabbit hole, the key thing with our government debt in South Africa is that it is mostly RAND denominated. What you see in Turkey, 80% of their debt was Euro denominated. So when the Lira crashed against the Euro, the debt just ballooned out of control. About 10% of our debt is non-RAND denominated. Ghana got into trouble because they tried to raise $3 billion and they got offered $30 billion. So they took it, their currency collapsed and they just simply can't afford to pay it back because you can't print dollars, but you can always print rands or lira if you're Turkish or Ghanaian. Anybody? <laughs> We've got listed property. I said that next door is Rosebank Moore. It's owned by Hyprop. So companies that all they do is their own properties are called REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. They're quite lacquer because you can buy REITs at the moment for about 70%, 80% of the value of the buildings. Of course, the value of the buildings, hmm, but it does mean that you go on a Sunday and you see a house and you like it, and the agent says it's worth a million, but you can get it for 800. Question is, is it really worth a million? I mean, that's what we have to ask ourselves. But also, they pay 75% of their profits as distributions. So they're nice income generators in that regard. And we've got a bunch of those. Of course, there's been some troubles. Office remains a challenge. Office is still, I track an index out of the US looking at 10 major metropolitan regions and office back to work. Essentially, those offices are running at 50% occupancy. Before pandemic, they were running at 1995. They're never at 100, but they're still only running at 50. There's a lot of vacant office lurking around. We've got commodities, the gold, oil, the copper, the PGMs, wheat, and et cetera, maize and the like. Uh, there's crypto, bitcoins, and all of those. Uh, impact investing, which is cows and farming and green energy and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, there's structured products, which in many cases will protect capital and give enhanced return, but also have lock-in periods. Our next power hour, 16 May, right here, will be on structured products. We'll be going into those deep. Derivatives, which is trading, CFDs, futures, all of those sort of things, short-term trading. Not this evening's presentation. We will have a presentation on trading later in the year. So there's lots of other ways that we can invest. I have a fairly simple rule, is that with one exception, everything I buy trades on a stock exchange, either South Africa or New York. Why? Because that exchange gives me an extra layer of protection. In South Africa, I've got the company, well, firstly, in South Africa, you've got the constitution, you've got a body of, of laws passed by parliament, which companies have to adhere to. We also have the Companies Act, which is a, an alarmingly easy document to read and a brilliant document. I mean, it's a really, really good act. And all companies have to adhere to that. But if you're also on the JSC, they've got extra levels of rules. What they don't do is say, are you a good company in terms of profitability? That's not their concern. That's our concern. What they do make sure is that the company has annual general meetings, publishes results, discloses important information. So I won't, you know, you've got a great company and you say, hey, Simon, I want to buy some of my shares. Uh, thanks, but no. My biggest challenge is liquidity. How do I, I mean, if you've got to sidle up to me at an event in Rosebank to sell them, I could sell my entire portfolio by five past nine tomorrow morning. Portfolio I've been building for decades. I could turn the entire thing into cash by five past nine tomorrow morning. Because the JC works on T plus three, I get the money in three days time. I could be in a plane to, oh, I'm not saying where. <laughs> Come on, you all thought I was gonna fall for that one. But then what about offshore investing? Before, why is the car driving on the water? <laughs> So interestingly, this is the one that had only one car on the water. 
because they give you four pictures every time. The one had like 60 cars in the water, and I'm like, ah, uh, one's enough. So then the question is, okay, cool, but so they actually probably are. We've seen what happened in, in Margate in Dubai. So what we've got, offshore investing. The principles are the same. There's companies we know, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, IBM, Walmart. All, again, it's, and then a bunch of companies we've never heard of. Bunches. I mean, as I said, there are 100,000 stocks listed around the world. I could probably name, yo, it would take me a long time, I could maybe get to 1,000. And then I would run out of names. But they're available. They're there. So the thing is, we can invest offshore too. Same principles apply. Quickly, in terms of, of legality and SARS, you've got one million a year discretionary per individual. It is calendar year, January, January to December, that you can take off, no questions asked. You can take another 10 million per year per individual if you say SARS please can I take more money off and if SARS thinks your affairs are up to date you can therefore take 11 million rand per person per year so unless you're Krista Visa or, or Patrice Nasepe it is more than enough capacity for us to take money offshore and it's easy I'll touch on the easy in a moment but how do we do it so we can do it direct offshore we literally take money offshore. We put it into something like a web trader or a shift or something like that. And we've got money offshore. And now we can go and buy shares in New York or London or Europe or Australia or wherever we want. We can also go and buy ETFs in all of those markets. So the S&P 500, we can go and buy that ETF. VOO is the code. The NASDAQ, we can buy that. QQQM is the code. M, not just the QQQ, M is slightly cheaper. So we can now get our money working for us in dollars. So that's the direct offshore. Indirect offshore is quite cunning. On the JSC, there are ETFs that track, for example, the S&P 500. So you buy it in rands on the JSC. The ETF issuer takes your rands, turns it into dollars, and goes and buys those 500 companies. So you've got two things moving price. One, if that basket of shares goes up, so does your ETF. Two, if the RAND weakens, well, your ETF goes up too. So you've got two movers in that point. And then, I mean, welcome to a New York alone, there are about 1,500 ETFs listed. We've only got 300 shares in South Africa, about 100 uh, uh, ETFs. New York's got 1,000 and a half. And then, of course, you can go to Europe and Ireland and all the rest. So you can do offshore, direct or indirect. The impact broadly is the same. You're going to get currency benefit and you're going to get the move of whatever that is. And it's not just S&P 500. You've got Japan, you've got India, you can go and buy, there's two China ones. Uh, there's emerging markets. There's a world one, global, which is my favorite. 9,000 shares across the world, all in one little ETF that I buy. The TRC, about 35 points, 0.35%, almost nothing. Because the key thing is, We are overly concentrated in South Africa. We live here, our job is here, our home is here, our retirement fund is here, our car is here. That's a lot of exposure to an economy that is half a percent of the global economy. And I'm not dissing South Africa. We have challenges. You know what? We have had challenges before. Go check our history. Challenges are not new to this country. But it's a case of live local, earn foreign. I mean, everyone wants to earn dollars. Okay, then earn dollars. Buy offshore ETFs, take money offshore, earn those dollars, live local. We want to live here. Of course we do. Turns out power and water are secondary. <laughs> what did someone say? You live in Joburg. Power, water, Wi-Fi. You can have two. But then how do we construct a portfolio? So the first port of call is that for most people, 100% ETFs. This is what we call your discretionary portfolio. You've got a pension fund already and all of that happening in the place of work. But putting 100% of your money into ETFs is the way that the vast majority of people in this country should do it. I manage accounts for my wife and my sister. Sounds more fancy than it is because I buy them ETFs. I think my sister's exclusively ETFs. I think my wife, because of legacy reasons, has some BHP group. ETFs are going to do what they say on the sticker. Stock markets, over time, is the best performing asset class. Stock markets, over time, beat inflation hands down. 
Therefore, stock markets over time create wealth. And an ETF is just a stock market in a basket. So we can just go and buy ETFs. As I typically, so nothing wrong with 100% ETFs. If you want to get fancy and build a portfolio, you want core, you want satellite. The core is the bit in the middle, which should be at least 50% ETFs. My portfolio is about 60% ETFs at this point in time. I'm targeting 75. It used to be 55. I'm slowly increasing that number to 75. Partly because the biggest risk to my portfolio is me. Now, come on, I have infinite ability to do stupid things. So I want a lot of ETFs there. And also, as your portfolio gets larger, which happens given time, it's like a little more scary when you push that buy button. And the worst thing in the world, you push the buy button and online share trading pops up and says, are you sure? <laughs> Hell no, I'm not sure. <laughs> Am I sure? No, no, not even a little bit. But what the heck, I'm there. So how do you do it? So in the middle, you have your ETFs. And then around it, you have smaller positions. If you want crypto, if you want single stocks, if you want alternatives, if you want to be trading, I do some trading and my trading portfolio is about 5%, 3 to 5% of my entire portfolio. I have some crypto. It's about, depending where the crypto price is, 1% or 2% of my entire portfolio. So that if crypto goes, I don't know, falls down a rabbit hole and goes to zero, because ultimately, let's be clear, it has no value, that's fine. It'll hurt, but it'll hurt a little bit at the end. An ETF can't go to zero. 500 shares in the US, 40 shares in South Africa. The only way that ETF goes to zero is if the sun crashes into our planet. Because then there's nothing left. The individual stocks absolutely can. So if you put all those other sort of alternatives, different assets that I spoke around, we put those all around in the satellites. And sometimes Dolly does brilliant in the pictures. I said, I want to satellite with a core and then individuals around. And Dolly's like, how about this? I'm like, I like that. It's art. Well, I don't know if it's art, but it's pretty. So then the question comes is, okay, ET is so lacquer, but I want to look at individual shares. How do I understand valuations? Welcome to subjectiveness like you've never heard before. So there are fancy ways to value companies. Price earnings ratio, discount cash flows, peg ratios, uh, dividend yields, economic data, uh, debt to equity, return on assets, return on equity. All of these different types of ratios that we can dig into. There is a ton that we can potentially learn. None of it is rocket science. That's perhaps the key point. This isn't rocket science. With me, mostly, I just buy ETFs every month. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. I ran cost over a lifetime of buying ETFs. Ultimately, I make money. Nice and simple. If you want to dig into it, the stockbrokers will have research. Go, go, go dig out that, go find that research. The company website, I appreciate the company website is done by PR and marketing, but there still can be some value there. Sense, Stock Exchange News Service. Every company in the JSC, if they've got information that they need to disseminate to the market, they use Sense. That would be directors buying or selling. That would be somebody else taking a big stake in the company or exiting. Mergers, acquisitions, results, details around dividends. All of those come via sense. What matters is know why you're buying and know what makes you sell. That's so important. When I buy a company, I write down, what am I why am I buying this company? Why did I buy a shop right 20 years ago? Superior margins, growing footprint, and better distribution. 20 years later, same story. What makes me sell shop right? Well, if those superior margins start to get squeezed, if that 6% becomes 5, 4, 3, 2, well, now we just pick and pay. Well, I know at the time, no. First year it goes to 5.5, and, and then it, you know, I, I was so late, put it that way. I'm not going to get it right at exactly that point in time. I don't expect to. That's far too much for, for, for someone like me. But, you know, I, I studied film and video at school, at, at tech. Now, I'm not a CA or a CFA or any of those C things. I'm nothing. Yeah, this is all self-taught. I can kind of read a balance sheet and an income statement. But when I say kind of, when I do it in front of an accountant per person, they like chuckle at me. It's like, dude, really? It's like, no, oh, really. <laughs> um, be very careful of FOMO and YOLO. FOMO, fear of missing out. You are always missing out. 
something somewhere. Yola, you only live once. Yes, you only live once. So try and avoid the stupid things. Like buying that share that could double or, or go to zero. I mean, it's lucky if it doubles. Goes to zero. No. My, one of my claim to fame, so I don't have many, one of them is I've never owned a company that went to zero in the history of my life. Probably more luck than skill, but I'll take it. Because I don't mind missing out. I've got a very small space where I'm smart about stuff. And the rest is like lacquer. Interesting. Shum, watch a YouTube video. Watch it swing on by. Can't help that. And then simple stuff. Hold on, that lady who's got, what happened to her forehead? <laughs> and interestingly, if you want Dolly to not give you white people, you have to specify. Because man, sorry to the white people, Dolly just does white. So you've got to say, please, Dolly, can I have a person of color? And then they do woman. <laughs> hey, I don't make the rules. So it is about learning. And, and there are books out there. And I can give you some lists of great books. As I said, the broker research. Stockbrokers are offering education. This is from Standard Bank this evening. Uh, there's, of course, all the YouTubes, podcasts, and social media. They, of course, come with giant warnings. There is quality out there, but, man, there is rubbish out there at the same time. Everyone in this room, everyone in this webcast has the capacity to be an informed, smart investor. It takes time. Time to learn. You know, Tuesday... Purple group results come out. So I spend an hour and a half reading the results. For me, that's fun. I know. But for me, that's fun. You might look at that and think, you know what, dude? I actually know what fun is. Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock, I could be having mimosas at uh, Tasha's. That's fun. Maybe you've got a job. <laughs> Maybe you want to go to gym. It does take time. And I'm fortunate. This is my job. When I'm reading the purple results, I'm actually doing my work. I interviewed the CEO the next day on my MoneyWare podcast. I invest into the business. I'm going to be asked questions about it. TV show tomorrow, they're going to, be going to talk about it. I need to know what's happening. And I enjoy it. I love numbers. If you don't, stick to the ETFs. Nice, simple, clean. So fees, you've got to pay for things. So some are fixed statutory fees, straight, 6 Rand 72. They're the ones who digitize your share certificates. Uh, and then it scales up in time. FSCA investor protection levy, 0.00031%. The cost, if you do a 1,000 Rand transaction, they'll charge you that very, very small amount, which goes to the FS FSCA to investigate skullduggery. STT, security transfer tax, you only pay it when you're buying. And you don't pay it on ETFs. It's a quarter percent. And then VAT on brokerage and straight. Brokerage is the fee that your broker charges you to do the transaction. There are two parts to that fee. There will be a percentage and there might be a minimum. So if someone says to you, my fee is 0.2%, but my minimum is 100 Rand, well, you've got to do a 50,000 Rand transaction to effectively be doing 0.2%. If you do a 1,000 Rand transaction and they charge you 100 bucks, 10%. Someone's making money here. And it's not you. They do part and then you get taken. So, brokerage, watch out for minimums. Platform or administration fees. If you're paying 100 bucks a month for a platform fee, what do you get for it? Are you happy with what you get for your 110 bucks? The answer is no, shop around. If the answer is yes, well, then you're in business. But make sure you know about it. Data fees, live prices cost money. Delayed prices from the JC are free. Live prices cost a fee. Do you need live prices? Not necessarily. If you want them, there's a fee associated. Collective investment schemes, the TIC. I've spoken about that already. Uh, there will be, that's the fund manager. There might also be a performance fee, not in your passive ETFs, but in your active, your, collect, uh, your unit trusts, there might well be a performance fee. In other words, if we do really great, we want to take more of your money. And when you do really bad, you give me money back? No, no, terrible idea. You might have an advisor fee, transaction fee, platform fee. You know what, I don't mind the fees. I, I would like free, but I appreciate someone's got to, you know, make money. But I want to know what they are, and I want them to be as sharp and as small as possible. This is the short answer. Less fee, there's more money in my pocket. And fees matter. 
three investments, 10,000 Rand growing 10% a year over 20 years. Zero fee ends up at 67,000. 1% a year, doesn't seem like a lot. 1% a year is 55,000. That's 12,000 Rand in somebody else's pocket. What did they do for that 12,000 Rand? If they bought you ice cream every Tuesday, okay, maybe. But if they didn't, what did they do for their 12,000? Maybe they did you more than 10% growth. Maybe they did you 13% growth. Oh, okay, now we're talking. But if they just had a nice brochure and a good ad campaign, mm, thanks, but no. And then just for the heck of it, I put in a 5% a year fee because my first unit trust they ever bought was actually a 5.5% fee plus performance and it lost money. My pension fund was 85 So your 5% fee, instead of 67, it's 24. Someone's got 43,000 in their pocket and you've got 24,000 in their pocket. Hell to the note. So risks, I said I would talk a lot about risk. There is individual stock risk. Stocks go bust. Yes, they do. Businesses go out of business. Happens all the time, all around the world. We manage that by diversifying, by having more than one business. Now look, you might've had diversified and you've got those five. Ouch. Look, it happened to someone, someone out there, and I'm sorry for you. I really, really am. I had four. <laughs> and I'm sorry for you. I had zero. I had, it's my claim to fame. Again, you have those ETFs which are immediately diversified. How many, if you're going to have, you remember your portfolio, minimum 50% ETFs. If you're going to do individual stocks, minimum 12, some say 20. I go around 12 or 14 because more than that, uh, I don't get the benefit of the good ones and it's too much for me to manage. Because with respect, I like numbers, but I ain't spending my Friday night on numbers. Market risk. Markets crash. Yes, they do. You never hear about markets in the general news until they crash. This chart here. So there's the crash of 2008. There's the crash of post-2001, the, 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 um, uh, the tech bubble bursting. There's the pandemic. There's the crash of 98, which at the time was terrifying. Emerging you market crisis, it was terrifying. You can hardly see it right down at the bottom left down there. Markets crash. But look what they've done after every single crash recovered. Now, the pandemic one was crazy, but they've recovered every time. This, which I grabbed off Twitter. 29, the market lost 90%. In 73, 50%. 87, it lost 30%. Uh, 2008, 55%. Pandemic, 35%. It has recovered after every single crash. Made new all time highs. The US market has done 10.5% in almost 100 years, doubling your money every seven. No, this is, this is SP. Yeah. US market. I don't have data going back far enough for our local market. But markets crash. Best thing to do when a market crashes, turn off your computer, go for a walk on the beach. And if you live in Joburg, I don't know. <laughs> Tashes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, country risk. Our country risk is a load shedding. Cost ShopRite 1 billion rand a year to run diesel. Here's an interesting thought. No load shedding for, what now, 20-something days? ShopRite saving money on diesel. Mm. Of course, we all kind of expect it to come back somewhere around about the 30th of May. <laughs> it will take a couple of hours. But there's other country risks. MTN's biggest country is Nigeria, then South Africa. The problem with Nigeria is the Naira devalued from 20 against the, the, the Tsar to 80 against the Tsar. So they still make X amount of money in Nigeria, but when they bring it back to rands, it's only a quarter of what it was before. Mm. And then some companies like a weak currency. For example, the gold miners. Because when the currency weakens, that $2,400 for an ounce of gold is more rands than it was a week ago. So they actually benefit from it. And then don't assume that the RAND is a one-way bet all the time. Yes, over the long term, the RAND will weaken. But in December of 2001, the RAND had 1361. I remember it because my wife and I rushed out to buy white appliances because we were never going to be able to afford them again. 
And five years later, the rand was 5 rand 75. 1361, 575. Why? One of the biggest commodity booms we've ever seen. So commodity prices go through the roof, we sell them in dollars, and we've got to turn them back into rands, and our rand strengthens. Provider risk. I get it all the time. On Twitters, on emails, hey Simon, I found this broker, what do you think? It's like I've never heard of them. Oh, but yes, but look at that, they've got this lovely purple color on their website. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love purple. But no, come on folks. With respect to the stockbrokers, and I think they're all out of the room, it's a commodity, more or less. Yes, there's some bells and whistles, <laughs> but broadly they're commodities. Go with the brands, go with those that are FSCA registered, although that doesn't stop them being cons necessarily. Just go with the ones, because the last thing, and I get it all the time, I put money in and I can't get it out, what can I do? Well, don't put more money in, it's a good place to start. I get it all the time, and I would say 99% of the time, the money doesn't come back, ever. 100%, it's gone. And I know they promised to do wild returns. Unless they were promising to marry you and they got a billion bucks in the bank, you're not going to get rich in a hurry because you find some dodgy broker on Facebook. Ever. And I mean ever. Absolutely ever. Uh, liquidity. Can you sell it? So I dabble in small caps. And the problem with that, and I'm not a big investor, I don't have billions, but sometimes when I'm getting in, like it's hard to buy all the shares. And then when I went to sell, well, there's a buyer, but he's like, or she is down there. So again, you'll see in the you'll see those one cent shares. Oh, if I buy it at one cent, I can sell it at two. Okay. Firstly, you can't buy it at one cent. Secondly, if you could, when you sell it at two, there is a queue of, in the one case, 17 billion shares ahead of you that have to trade before you trade. Stick to the big ones. Absolutely. Inflation, it's a risk. Interest rates, right now, interest rates is hurting everyone. It hurts us because we've got debt, but it hurts companies because they have debt. Inflation hurts because it pushes up costs. So there are risks. There are risks plenty. I mean, if you want zero risk, it's really simple. You put the money in your couch. I don't know. I thought it was meant to go under. I thought it should go under the mattress. The couch seemed like a strange. I, I'm assuming this is like a like like a like a 20 person couch. Anyway, if you want no risk, put your money under the couch, and then you've got two risks: your kids find it, or your house burns down, and then it's all gone. And truthfully, you're getting killed by inflation. Every year, it decreases in value. You step into the market. However, you do it, you take some risk. Key point is, you diversify that risk. That's how you manage it. You buy lots of different bits. Individually, in an ETF, nice, simple, easy. Tax. Well, I know, we've grown. So, there's really two ways to avoid tax. Make no money, be dead. And if you are investing, there are some taxes to pay. So, income tax. If you are doing short-term trading, using derivatives or buying and selling within three year period, SARS is going to say, very nice, well done, that is income, and therefore it gets added to your income and taxed as income, which if you're a baller at the top percentages is 45%. You're going to make a lot of profit to be able to pay 45% and still be ahead. Also, interest for income from REITs, real estate investment trusts, interest that you earn from money in the bank, or a retail savings bond, those are income. If you're under 65, your first 24,800 is tax-free. If you're over 65, your first 34,500 is tax-free. Anything above that is added to your income and taxed accordingly. If you are a long-term holder, if I were to sell my ShopRite shares tomorrow because I've held them for more than three years, I pay capital gains tax. The first 40,000 of capital gains every year is tax-free. Thereafter, any capital gains, 40% is added to your income. So effectively, if you're at the top 45% tax bracket, your capital gains is 18%. But 
But if you're at the 20%, uh, 30% tax bracket, your capital gains is effectively 12%. Not lacquer, could be worse. And in fact, I, I, I was looking around. The US, the inclusion rate is 100%. At least we only got a, we got a 40%. And then dividend withholding tax. And I got to say, this is the one that, that I like least. Standard Bank declares a one rand dividend and you get 80 cents. And you're like, oi, what happened was they sent 80 cents to you and they sent 20 cents to SARS. There's a 20% dividend withholding tax. You don't even see that money. It sort of just goes straight to SARS. Like it didn't even wave as it went past. It just straight to SARS. But there are some tax benefits out there. There's your regulation 28, which is your pension fund, retirement fund, retirement annuity, all of those. You can put 350,000 or 27.5% of your income, whichever is smaller, and that amount is deductible from your income. So if you earn a million rand and a year and you put 200,000 into your Reg 28, you'll only be taxed on 800,000 income. They catch you when you take it out in retirement. They tax you there. Don't get me wrong. They're going to they're gonna get you. And if you put more in, if you put more than the limits, you can roll it into next year or the year after wherever in a day. And the other one is tax-free investing within limits. I'm not going to spend time on that. I did a February presentation on that. You'll find it at justonelap.com slash power hour, where you also find this video in about six hours time. Tax-free investing is post-tax income, but whatever money you make in there is tax-free. Dividends, you don't pay the 20%. Capital gains, there is none. If you buy and sell within two minutes of each other and make a profit, there's no income tax. It is 100% tax-free. Before you start your discretionary investing, i.e. going and deciding what to buy and the like, max out those two. Max them out, then go and buy on your own. So in closing, and I'm going to have some minutes for some questions. Diversify. I can't say it enough. It doesn't matter how great a stock is. And there's always the story about, for example, Capitec which you could have bought for one rand on the day it listed. And it's now some 2,000 rand. But on the day it listed, Sumbo had gone bust the week before. You were a brave person to buy it at one rand. And truthfully, Capitec was just an unsecured lender. They weren't a bank yet. They weren't doing anything particularly fancy. I did eventually buy them, but I bought them about six years after listing, I paid 20 Rand for them, which sounds crazy, right? This thing's gone from one to 20. What are you doing? It was a great business and it was eating the other bank's lunch. And I went from 20 to 2000. Even that was a hundred bagger. But let's be clear, I'm talking about those that worked. I managed to avoid Steinhoff, but there are people out there who paid 90 Rand for Steinhoff and got 20 cents. There are, I mean, the, the market is littered with individual stocks that had a horror. Point is, diversify. Diversify across sectors, diversify across asset classes, diversify across currencies, across geographies. Just diversify. As I said, one of my favorite ETFs has got 9,000 shares in it. That is diversify. And I know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean I know some of the, I mean, you know, NVIDIA will be there, Microsoft, Meta, yes, Apple. But those tail end 7,000 shares, and even if you told me who they were, I probably don't know what they do or where they come from. Diversify. First port of call, and the easiest way to do that is ETFs. Buy quality, always be buying quality. If you want to gamble, go to the casino because they'll give you drinks. Leave the rats and mice for the rat catchers. Keep costs low. Costs matter. Costs is money out of your pocket and compounding. You know how we talk about compounding and how you know your profits compound onto each other? Yeah. Costs do the inverse, right? They compound out of your life and run into somebody else's pocket. I appreciate that person needs to be paid. I appreciate that person is doing a job and they deserve to charge a fee. It just needs to be as baby a fee as possible and a fee that I'm happy with. If not happy, walk away. 
Max out your tax benefits, first your Reg 28 and your tax free. Folks say, which one should I do first? My answer is yes. Both of them. Uh, structure a core satellite portfolio. And I go back to the point I made on that slide. Probably for 98% of people, ETFs is all you need. Buy an ETF for every month, or maybe as you get money, bonus time, maybe you're a commissioned earner, whatever the case may be. Buy ETFs on a very regular basis, ignore them, come back in, depending how old you are, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years time. You will create wealth. You might not be Warren Buffett. But you know what? We don't need to be Warren Buffett. We don't even need to be in the top 100 of the richest people. This is how we create wealth. And I appreciate it's hard because the old adage is spend less than you earn. And everyone's like, yeah, I've heard that. Have you tried to do it? Have you looked what stuff costs out there? There was something I bought the other day. I forget. I managed with sticker shock. Like I picked it up and I looked at the price and I'm like, you slowly, carefully, because you don't want to break it, put it back down. Avocados. I know, avocado, it's that, that's on me. I mean, so I never used to eat avos, right? I, I, I probably haven't eaten an avo in 40 years. And then suddenly, in the last year, I'm eating avos. And you know what? Man, those things cost money. Like money. Like our ex-finance minister, Mr. Mbueni, has got a whole farm of them. We need to make friends with them. <laughs> Dude, instead of this tinned fish story, man, those avos, you've got, you've got gold in them, their hills. Yeah. Is my man. When we were in Durban, they just sort of fell out of the tree as we were walking past. Now it falls out the tree, and as it goes past, it grabs your wallet and like, thank you for coming. So hold lots of ETFs and keep going at it. And what I mean by keep going at it, there are going to be times when markets crash. There are going to be times, which is perhaps even more painful, when they just go sideways forever. And you're like, yo, guys, I've got time. Like, I've got, to like, like, yeah, yo. I've got places to be in retirement to do. You know, there's, there's beaches out there that need surfing. There are going to be times when money is tight, when things happen, and you can't contribute. Let's be clear. Life is difficult at times. Life is complex most of the time. And sometimes things are expensive, like right now. Keep at it. Starting small is still starting. I got an email earlier this year. Young kid, I think he's 14. He says, all I have is 500 bucks. Is it worth it? And I'm like, yeah, 100%. Absolutely worth it. Why? Because you're 14. You know what a stock market is. You somehow managed to track me down. He's going to go places. And that 500 bucks when he's 74, is going to be a pile of money. And probably he'll add to it even more than that. On that point, engage the youth. Terrible phrase. Engage the kids. I don't buy my niece and nephew presents. No, no, they've got grannies in London and mothers and fathers and all of that sort of thing. I buy them ETFs. They're not going to be Warren Buffett. The key thing is I bought it on their first birthday. My nephew's 13. My niece is almost, sorry, my nephew's 16. My niece is almost 14. What have they got? Time. Massive amounts of it. So that's the debate, tax-free or not. We'll park that one there. Keep on learning. There's, and, and careful of, particularly, I mean, I once probably owned 20, 25 ETFs. Why? Because their new one gets issued. Hello? New ETF would get issued, and I would be like, oh, look at this shiny new ETF. I must own some of Oh, another one. I must own. And I ended up, and then I'm like, you know what? And I cut them all down, and I've only got a couple. But keep learning. Again, it's not rocket science. And ultimately, we get rich, we create wealth, but it happens slowly. That's the key point. The cliche is this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. It's not even a marathon. I mean, this makes the comrades' race look like an amateur thing. This takes time. But it is in with every one of our abilities. Notwithstanding, it is tough being a human being on planet Earth right now. Thank you, interest rates and inflation. Different offerings, online share trading, local, full service, 
Auto Share Invest, local offering, sits within standard internet banking, standard bank internet banking. Shift Offshore Offering, it's not every share, 100,000 shares offshore, it's the ones that matter. You can also get foreign currency. I said earlier, take a million offshore, you do it, shift, click, click, happens. Best app I've had in a long time. Web Trader is an offshore platform. You literally, you put dollars into it, you buy some dollars with shift, you put it into Web Trader, and now you've got thousands of foreign shares and ETFs that you can invest into. And as much as, I mean, online share trading started in 1999, uh, Richard Zedden started it. The big innovation in the last couple of years has been the ease at which we can now do offshore. Things such as Shift, things such as, as, as Web Trader. Even just 10 years ago, it was like visits to the bank and proof of who you are and lock of your grandmother's hair and fees that like someone was buying, a, you know, they, had, they were buying a yacht this weekend and Simon walked in. It's like, ha, huh, payment for the yacht. Next power hours. So weird thing in the future. I said to them, give me cars within the future. They have lasers coming out the back of the car. And that's going to be, I'm assuming, oh, of course, because it's driverless cars. So it doesn't matter. You're not being blinded. I don't know. So we've got one of these a month. The next is 16 May structured products. We're going to do small caps, tech, financials, elections, commodities, value, and trading. Those will all happen monthly here on out. There will be Thursdays. There will be 5.30. There will be here. There will be webcast. And the video will be online, YouTube, just one lap within five or six hours of the event ending. And then I said to it, please make me a sign that says thank you. And it misspelled you. <laughs> Dolly, we need to talk. Uh, 1,000 Rand in an OST account. Tweet them, follow them. They'll put 1,000 bucks in your account. And 500 bucks into two shift accounts. Follow, tweet, shift global. How many instruments can one get on shift? Don't ask me. I don't know. Ask the lady in the corner who may or may not have a relationship with shift. I own, I'm going to amounts would be lots. Does that qualify? Um, contact details for everyone. Folks, A, my time is done. In fact, I've run my time disclaimers because they're important. A huge thanks to everybody. A huge thanks to Standard Bank for picking up the power hours. This has been an event we've been running since February of 2011. It's something I've always thoroughly enjoyed doing. Most fun is to be back in front of an audience. We will continue to do this during the year. I promise I will. I might not wear a suit every time. Eh? This was like a first off. Um, so, and I only have one suit left, and it gets awkward by the 11th time. It's like, yeah, I think we've seen that suit before. But I appreciate your coming through to Rosebank, the folks on the webcast. I appreciate your time. You could have been anywhere else for this last hour. You chose to be here. We really, really do thank you. Ladies and gents, thank you very, very much for your time. I'm going to end the webcast, but if there are questions, I'm not running anywhere. Uh, there's still some snaps up front. Addition is raising his hand. Oh, that was the most important point. Reception. Give them your parking ticket. Otherwise, you're stuck downstairs. And, and, and I don't know what that means. It means you're stuck downstairs. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time this evening. We'll see you, hopefully, in a month's time. All the best.